This is another in the series of videos focused on projects which jointly support thermal and visual assessments. In a previous video, we looked at the workflow for assessing daylight factors in an ESPR building model with a rather simple facade. Oh, and, well, using ESPR is perhaps an overkill when there are quite a few tools out there that support daylight factor calculations in that building context. But what about complex facades? Here we have a historic building in Edinburgh, Scotland, in which a traditional stone facade was to be retained and a new office building created inside. It had both core and perimeter atria. And just to make it really interesting, the inside floor plates didn't align with the facade. And as with many traditional Victorian buildings, the facade was rather more than a meter thick. The complexity of this facade is also evident if we look at the building plan. So what staff within the building and the public experience as they walk by that building now was hardly crystal clear during early design meetings. The scope of what simulation tools might deliver to design teams was also less known and the tools themselves less friendly. Our group had a remit to bring simulation support to groups who were faced with out of the ordinary design issues. And goodness, there were challenges to understanding the thermal and visual implications of that atria and those offset floor levels. Indeed, at the end of the project, we learned so much, we jointly wrote a paper about it and presented it at an IBIPSA conference. Here are a few slides from that conference. The first shows a range of thermal issues related to the atria. The design team wanted proof that the atria could act as a buffer to limit overheating. And beyond looking at the dynamics of the atria, there were box tickers that wanted to express that dynamics as an equivalent U-value. That took us into some interesting territory. The project provided lots of new information design meetings. For example, they asked for daylight factors. Yes, fine. But we also realized that renderings we could also generate would clarify spatial relationships. And when they saw that, that led to what-if questions, which we processed during the design meeting and presented later. Getting that kind of feedback after a coffee break or a lunch break instead of the usual weekly exchange of formal reports, wow, that was a game changer in 2003. No, it wasn't easy. I remember having to adopt the software to support aspects of this project. Let's have a look at the original model and the original approach. We created focused thermal models at specific slices through the building. The geometric and compositional resolution was well, considered reasonable at the time. It was somewhat abstract about framing of the inner facades However, we zoned the model to explicitly represent the occupied spaces and the floor and ceiling voids. Thermally, the perimeter and core atria were composed of stacks of thermal zones so that the temperature stratification could be tracked. And in anticipation of explorations of the perimeter atria as a buffer space with controlled natural ventilation. Of course, this was way before it was common to populate office buildings with furniture and fittings, so looks kind of like an empty building. What made sense at the time was to set the boundaries of the perimeter atria at the inside face of the masonry facade. If we look from the side, the choice to treat the ceiling voids as separate spaces was an early effort to better capture and distribute heat gains from lighting fixtures so that the comfort and control could take into account the warmth of the floor and the ceiling surfaces. In that section, the dots are locations where daylight factors would be sensed. 
The thermal model was designed for alight assessments in mind. So as the form and composition evolved on the thermal side, we could evolve new visual models from them. This approach has some downsides. An outside rendering in radiance looks kind of wonky, but for inside visual assessments, well, it wasn't really an issue. The design team was concerned about what staff working at different levels of the building might experience, so we generated views at each of the levels looking toward the inside face of that retained facade. We'll scroll from the upper part of the building down to the basement level. Certainly, without internal lighting in the model, the office spaces presented lots and lots of contrast. As simple as they were, such renderings did clarify for the design team some of the impacts of those floor assets. Good stuff for a couple of decades ago. Not really the kind of thing that raise eyebrows very much now. So why this video? Revisiting a 2003 model in 2024 is an opportunity to take stock of what decades of hardware and software evolution might apply for projects of similar thermal and visual complexity. For some practitioners, that evolution has simply delivered speed. Same deliverables, but in a fraction of the time. The feedback loop gets shorter. For others, that evolution over time has allowed a given time resource to yield higher resolution renderings, i.e. more bounces, more pixels. And because visual comfort is location specific, well, maybe more viewpoints could be assessed. But those are static. Animations of sun patches, yeah, they were possible in 2003, but took ages. Now, they're a realistic deliverable to demonstrate the temporal nature of that perimeter atria. Here, in the E2R module of ESPR, which is tasked with driving radiance, it adapts the sun and sky conditions, re-renders for a given scene. The sequence of images can then be stitched together to form an animation. For some members of the design team, that kind of thing communicates an awful lot. If we look at the thermal side of things, even after a couple of decades, I would still use focus slices through the building to support what-ifs and constrain the model scope until the major thermal issues have been resolved. What I find more interesting is whether we, as simulationists, are at a tipping point where our views about what constitutes models that are actually fit for purpose. If this set of design challenges arrive today, what approach might I take? I'm still a fan of focused models and delaying complexity. So model slices of a building, that to me is still a valid approach. Yeah, fine. Once things have settled down, maybe I would consider a whole building model. But this project took up an entire city block. The elephant in the room was always the considerable difference between the form of the inside and outside faces of that facade. It's a serious stretch to consider this as a 1D conduction problem. And when I was giving workshops on Passive House, that same point applies. Deep facades are ubiquitous. And also ubiquitous are thermal bridges. And that would be part of a modern remix of this kind of project. For visual assessments, one would expect a bit more resolution in the outer and inner facades. There are some techniques I've developed for treating thick facades much more explicitly. Not quite 3D conduction. Let's call it 1.5D conduction. If you'd like to hear a bit more about that, Leave a comment and I'll perhaps make a further video.
other aspects that I might change? Well, fully populating the office space would help with glare assessments, but pragmatically, some desks would certainly help provide some scale in those huge spaces. The decades have also introduced new tools for spatial understanding. Blender comes to mind. If it had been available at the time, it would have certainly been part of that des those design meetings. The workflow for exporting an ESP model to Blender involves the usual steps. Identifying what thermal zones and entities in the model to include, and whether to ignore glazing so we can more easily see into that Blender model. The process includes taking each surface in the thermal model and expanding it to become a solid body that has the thickness of the, the related construction. Where the workflow for this complex facade differs is that the surface polygons in some thermal zones, such as the facades and the ceiling voids, are the polygons really at the outer face of those bodies to be created. Of course, in the occupied spaces, the polygon is at the inner face of the body to be created. And when looping through the thermal model, the user needs to confirm which status applies to each. If you want to know more about cooperative working with ESPR and Blender, there's a video. I invite you to have a look. In this case, let's open up Blender and adjust the model so that we can do a spatial review. In terms of simulating light, I prefer Radiance as the tool rather than Blender. And if you've seen prior videos about ESPR driving Radiance in that simple facade building, well, much that follows will be familiar. We're going to invoke the E2R module of ESPR, and, well, we could ask for an internal simulation,
might be a good place to start just to check that the model is correct. But in this case, we're going to select daylight factors and answer some questions. Now, the complexity of the building suggests that we do a bit of planning in order to answer those questions. So, what spaces are we interested in? What are the dimensions of the space? What grid density is appropriate? And we need to align the grid with something, so we need to identify the edge uh, we're going to pick for that. So, planning done, let's set up that grid as much as we did in earlier videos. Assuming that grids to our liking, it's time to melt the computer. A note, a denser grid really only has a minimal impact on processing time. Basically what takes the time is reaching convergence. We add, we keep adding more bounces until conditions settle. In this particular case, we got there after going to five bounces. After the CPU melting is finished, well, Let's have a look at the data file that was generated. So there's the location of each of the grid points and the daylight factor. A few lines of Python code and, well, here's a map of daylight factors. So this is a starting point. If we were to enrich the context of that space by, say, fully populating the office with desks and chairs and monitors and things like that, then we would have a much better place to start looking at visual comfort studies, such as glare or the Gluth visual comfort probability, which we'll cover in a later video.